Uh, Dan, uh, hold. We got. I mean, w- breaking news here. I uh, just getting in word that um, from here on out, Taylor Swift is only going to games against the Chicago Bears, and uh, because mm. she she doesn't understand um, rooting for a team that uh, can't actually move the football, so she's only going to go and root for teams that are playing the Chicago Bears because that's how she now perceives the game of football that did like, Sounds she just sees right. them as just like, as this team that just gives the other team wins. And, and um, so I believe next week she's going to be in the uh, box for Jerry Judy of uh, the Broncos ah. at soldier field. Okay. She's going to be dating okay. Jerry Judy next week. Uh, and we'll, we'll keep kind of going from there. Very exciting uh, for, uh, for Broncos nation next week. Cause they need it yeah. uh, just as badly as, as anyone. Well, she'll get a tour of the country, which is beautiful. Uh, uh, get, yeah. get a lot of new places. Not, you know, because I'm sure she's never toured any a- anywhere throughout the country. No. Uh, so yeah, no. she'll, she'll get to take in some. She's new a real sites. homebody. She'll be real nice. But you know, <laughs> hey, hey, kudos to her and the Kelsey family. It sounds like they had a wonderful time, and she got to see her apparently new boyfriend score a touchdown. So that's just beautiful. I mean, such wholesome content. I, I, show. I gotta be honest, no joke. So like all last week, so on my morning show. Uh, on my, in my radio station, uh, me and my co-host were talking about it because we're in. We carry the Kansas City Chiefs actually on my station, so mm. we we you know we we talk Chiefs football uh, you know a decent amount. I I try to, and um, long story short, that obviously was percolating. And Travis Kelsey said he texted her and all this stuff. We casually hanging out, so we talked about it on the morning show, and I was very much like, "There's no way this is real." Like. It's as real as is yeah, that it just Travis, too quickly, right? Yeah, the Travis said he might have texted her, got a hold of her. Maybe they did like, like get, grab a quick dinner somewhere really quick. Like he flew somewhere, met her or something. And I was like, but it's no, it's going anywhere. And when they announced an hour before the game yesterday that she was gonna be there, I literally was like, I'm I'm a dead man. Like I'm dead. Like the the Bears <laughs> were not winning this now. game. The yeah. Bears were not winning this game anyways. They're definitely not winning this game if Travis Kelsey has got Taylor Swift to actually show up at this game. Chiefs by a billion, and it was about that. It was. It was indeed. Yeah, some added motivation that the Chiefs didn't even need uh, going into that game, and uh, the Bears couldn't could believe use, it. Uh, anything that they can get, uh, we will get to that very depressing and I'm sure animated reaction from yourself later on in this recap episode, but uh, yeah, enough of the housekeeping. Let's dive into our week three recap. Yeah, so if the image there didn't didn't give away uh, the highlights for sure, the the Miami Dolphins uh, yeah. taking up about sixty percent of real estate. Uh, in this one. And then, of course, the Buffalo Bills putting up a lot of points as they continue to cruise as well. A couple of the notable games uh, for this slate. This I think they play weekend. each other next week, too. The two of them. I didn't even check to see. If, uh, I, I just yeah, I that think that sense. popped popped into my head uh, that they they may actually they do. Play indeed. Each other. They do indeed. Miami hosts or no Buffalo hosts Miami. Uh, one o'clock game. I, I wonder if they can uh, do some. Yeah. Can we get that in the Sunday night football? That. Because right. Sunday night football <laughs> next week is Jets and uh, uh, and uh, Chiefs, oh, so if we could, oh, if we could find a way to get we could find a way to get that uh, Buffalo Bills Miami game flex, that would be lovely. Could we do that? Early season flex would be much in favor for sure. Uh, what it was a weird week, actually. I would say you know the last couple of weeks were were fine. Uh, I know week one we had talked about how that was a strange start to the NFL season. Yeah. Not much offense. And offenses have been slow to get going uh, the last couple of weeks, but uh, I thought last week in particular was more normal and and par for the course what we expect this week. Once again, it's like records breaking, weird records at that. Uh, we had lopsided scores. We had a score of Gami uh, this week, and um, and and some history being made. So, uh, interesting week in the NFL, and we will kick off our recap, Mark, with the Thursday night game between the Jets and the 49ers. Can't imagine yeah. this is going to take up too much of our discussion because it's going to be the same thing with the 49ers and probably the same thing with the Giants as well. Uh, 49ers win this one 30 to 12, and it's the 13th straight victory there for San Francisco. 
Uh, that's their straight regular season win, I should say. McCaffrey tying Jerry Rice as well for 12 consecutive games with a touchdown uh, in franchise history. Uh, but really, this one, uh, they didn't have Brandon Ayuk, did the 49ers, so Debo Samuel was the guy that lit up the box score, as well as Christian McCaffrey. Uh, Brock Purdy was kind of uh, more of the same of what we've seen the last couple weeks. Uh, didn't didn't kill them. Uh, wasn't overly amazing either. Uh, but Mark, the Giants, just 29 yards rushing. Obviously, yeah, brutal. couldn't get anything going to start this game, and Daniel Jones tops it all off with no touchdowns and a pick uh, to his resume for this one. So Boiled down to the Giants couldn't move the ball and the 49ers controlled this one from the start. Yeah, no Saquon Barkley, so that obviously hurts the Giants offensively. You know, as far as uh, taking anything from this game, the one thing I will say is that I still don't know exactly what this Giants team is. What I do think we know is that this Giants team cannot compete at the top level, but they're certainly better than the bottom of like the Cardinals, Bears, uh, bottom barrel teams like Broncos right now. I feel like they are better than that just slightly, but they're not Throwing anywhere shade on the Cardinals. They just beat the Cowboys big time. Yeah, but that's because everyone else was like likes the Cowboys a lot more than I have. I had yeah, if, yeah, uh, yeah. if you watch my video, I had said, I think I said it on this show. I had the Cowboys, my power rankings. Like I, I think I had them eighth last week after the two and zero start. I was not buyers of the Cowboys. That was before the Trayvon Diggs injury as well. So, hmm. but you know what I'm trying to say is I feel like we know yeah, now the Giants, I think the Giants ceiling is still very much like competing for a wild card. I, I really do think there's that possibility of that. Um, but a lot of that'll be determined in the next couple of weeks. I don't think they're bottom out, like only going to be a four win team. Um, as far as the uh, San Francisco goes, what we learned from San Francisco is nothing new. They're a wagon. They are the most talented uh, football team maybe in the in the NFL definitely in the top two or three and the 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 question will be Brock Purdy because there were times during this game where Brock Purdy he looked small he looked unathletic and he looks um inaccurate at times like he you know the the old saying is like well he can make any throw Brock Purdy can't make any throw I firmly believe that I really truly believe Brock Purdy can't just make any throw He's not that like there that verbiage does not go with Brock Purdy. But what Brock Purdy does really well is he runs Kyle Shanahan's offense really, really well. And that is what is keeping him alive and afloat right now. But it ultimately is one of the things I think could be the ceiling on the 49ers in their season. They haven't really been tested yet in that moment where they need Brock Purdy to just step up and make the plays. Maybe they won't be tested in that way, and maybe they will walk to a Super Bowl. I don't know. But right now, I think that's the only legitimate question you can have about the Niners. Yeah, San Fran 3-0 and right now. I think that's a good point. They haven't truly been tested or pushed to their limit or even threatened for a, a game uh, because they have just been leading uh, so handily in, in each of these contests. So it's a good point uh, kind of dissecting what we've seen from them so far, it's hard to to make grand proclamations, but you'd be hard pressed to say they're not a top three team in the NFL right now, just based on the performances we've seen from them and just the general roster that they do have. I mean, I can't imagine if they had uh, a top 12 quarterback uh, leading this offense, uh, that would just be next level. I'd probably uh, have them as a shoe in to go to the Super Bowl right now. And, um, and I mean, they're one of the top teams in the NFC, but, uh, it's interesting. We've been seeing some some really good play from NFC teams uh, as of, as of recently, and the AFC has kind of struggled. We'll get more to that in a moment, but we'll stay in the NFC for our next game with the Falcons on the road at the Lions. Yeah, and uh, or I'm sorry, the Titans at the Browns first. Getting ahead of myself. Titans uh, three, Browns twenty seven. Another rough outing for Tannehill and company after they had somewhat bounce back last yeah. week. Yeah. Uh, return back to their week one status. Only three points managed in this one. Six first downs and 94 total yards of offense for Tennessee. 2.1 yards per play. This was the fewest yards ever since moving to Tennessee uh, and, and transferring the franchise from Houston to the Tennessee Titans. So that's a lot of years there in Tennessee, and they've never put up fewer uh 
yards of offense than they did in this game. Pretty incredible stuff there. I will say, you know, Miles Garrett, three and a half sacks. He was a huge headline for this game and, and really took over. But this was the best game of Deshaun Watson's tenure in Cleveland, and he really yeah. looked a lot more polished and comfortable. And that included a behind the a, a ridiculous throw yeah. twenty yards behind him, and that oh, was the dude, best I game of his. That. I know it was that was an unbelievable. I can't believe he he did that. He literally threw it backwards, and he threw it at about thirty five miles an hour. It's uh, crazy. Five feet to go. Yeah, that was insane. But. Yeah, no, I mean that's. I'll toss it to you with that, um, with with Watson just being a little bit more comfortable. I mean, maybe, uh, you know, like we were saying, he, he is almost certainly not returning to form that he was in the the heyday in Houston. Uh, yeah. But he also is probably not as bad as we saw the the first two weeks. Now we're seeing maybe a little bit more uh, comfort and and what he can be with this offense, especially when Amari Cooper is healthy and on the field for him. If the Browns aren't playing the Steelers, they they might be able to beat anyone in the league. Like, that's how good their defense is playing right now. And offensively, I felt like they came out and made a real statement without Nick Chubb. Watson did play much better, even with that ridiculous pass uh, aside. And so uh, Cleveland's dangerous. Cleveland is officially in the dangerous category. They struggle within their own division. But again, that division is, I think, the most unique division as far as the rivalries and everyone who beats who and how they beat each other. I mean, yeah, I know the Jets just lost for like 15 straight in a row to the Patriots or whatever, but it feels like certain teams just can't play. It's like the Bears with the Packers just can't play the Packers, but yet, you know, on a good year, they can, they can play with other teams. That's what Cleveland feels like right now. And for Tennessee, this was a chance for them to build some momentum and continue to kind of shock and surprise people. And, and they just completely laid an egg. And I don't know what it is with that offense. I don't think it's the scheme. I don't necessarily think it's all the talent. I think it's the motor, the, the Ryan Tannehill inaccuracies, like the ability to just like spark big plays. I don't know what it is exactly, but that is, uh, it was ugly offensive football from Tennessee and even though they have a very solid defense, when your offense is just three and out, three and out, three and out, three and out, eventually the dam's going to break in this modern NFL with the way the rules are. And especially against a capable Browns offense like that. Um, this is what I like to call a pecking order game. I don't think either of these two teams are going to win their division. They were both teams we both put in that wild card chase. And this is a pecking order game. Cleveland now gets to earn the right to be ahead of Tennessee in that pecking order as far as the 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 AFC rankings go. And I know that seems silly. It's like, oh, yeah, well, they beat them. It's the standings things. But you know what I mean? Like, it's early in the season. Teams are trying to figure out who these teams are, where they belong in power rankings and 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 feeling about them. And yeah, just Cleveland right forward, you feel better about Cleveland. No question. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Tennessee is Tennessee. Not a lot of juice right now. Their physicality seems to be lacking uh, with that team. Uh, you know, they, they used to play bully ball the last few years. I mean, yeah. Derrick Henry is able to just rip off five yard runs when they needed it the most. They are struggling to run the football. And I don't know if it's maybe Derrick Henry's not uh, as healthy a as build. I don't know if the offensive line is just not blocking as well as they used to. I haven't been able to do, you know, that deep of a dive into this team, but it does seem that way. And then Ryan Tannehill is just not providing anything. But also, I mean, what does it say about your last two quarterback draft picks when Ryan Tannehill is having these stat like terribly bad starts and there hasn't even been a whiff of reports of Will yeah. Levis or Malik Willis threatening anything in practice or even just trying to get these guys involved with even special packages on the field to have Malik get you some spark on a, on a run? Nothing. So I feel it's a rough situation now for Tennessee because that tells me, and maybe, you know, Will Levis is a rookie, still got time. Maybe he's just not, uh, you know, up to it right now. But I mean, I, I, I do wonder where Tennessee goes from here, especially if they're that middle of the road team, they're not going to get yeah. a top quarterback. Then what are they going to do? They're going to be in quarterback purgatory for quite a while. So that's something I'm looking at. But yeah, they got to get the run game right because that's been their bread and butter. And, uh, you know, you got DeAndre Hopkins, but you're not really able to do much with him if uh, no one's respecting your ability to run. So they're, they're going to need that. They got a trip to the Bengals next week, and then it's uh, Colts, Ravens, Falcons, Steelers. So 
uh, you know, with the way the Colts have been playing lately, that's certainly not a gimme for them either. Uh, that, that's a, a tough stretch there for the Titans, for sure. All right, moving on from the Titans and Browns to the Falcons and the Lions. Uh, Falcons 6, Lions 20 in a game where the Lions really took control uh, for most of this. Their defensive and offensive fronts won the day, held Atlanta to just 44 yards rushing, which this has been their MO this year was uh, Atlanta's ability to run the football 200 yards here, 200 yeah. yards there, 44 yards on the ground for them. Meanwhile, the Lions put up 115 on the ground themselves. Uh, and, you know, speaking to the de defensive front there for Detroit, seven sacks of Desmond Ritter, just Atlanta Ooh. could not uh, remotely get comfortable or settled uh, and, and able to kind of stack some drives there. They were getting stalled pretty quickly. And Despite not the greatest play from Jared Goff and company, uh, he did run in a touchdown and, and had another through the air. Uh, they were able to do the necessary things to pull out a, a physical win and uh, and win by 14 points. So you'll take that any day, uh, even if it was you only putting up 20 points in your high-powered offense. You'll take that uh, against a Falcons team that had been rolling up to this point. Yeah, absolutely. I think they the Lions did exactly what you need to do defensively against a team like Atlanta. If you can stop the run and make them panic and get behind, then they put the ball in the quarterback's hand and Desmond Ritter had to throw the ball 38 times and he's clearly he not Man. capable and comfortable doing that. And uh, and that just led to an easy, just seemed like an easy victory for the Lions. Shout out to Sam Laporta. Uh, Jared Goff finding Stodden. his tight end. They, uh, you know, they got rid of Hawkinson. They go right back to Iowa and go get the next tight end. And Laporta looks like a real player for this offense who they still haven't got Jamison Williams back yet. They, you know, they're not even a hundred percent full strength with uh, Montgomery Williams, all the pieces offensively. Uh, and so look out for the Lions. Great bounce the back win for them. Four NFL tight ends to come out of Iowa are are also the last four tight ends for Iowa. George Kittle, TJ Hawkinson, Noah Fant, and now Sam Laporta. And they're I all mean, real if there was players any question in the about NFL. tight end you. Yeah, they're yeah. all good. Exactly. Quality starting NFL tight ends. Uh, yeah, Iowa's tight end you for sure. But yeah, didn't mean to cut you off there, but had to include that. No, nugget. and that's it. Awesome. I mean, the Lions quality win bounce back. You had a, a weird got out of hand loss against Seattle at home. You're two and one. The rest of the division is looking really shaky. The Lions by far look like the, the most capable team in the NFC North right now. They're just on a on a comfortable trajectory. No, there's no worry or concern. There's not glaring holes with this Detroit team. Yeah, you feel confident they're going to win this division already. And uh, to your point, with the way that uh, the rest of the teams in the division are playing, there's not much uh, optimism elsewhere in the NFC North, that's for sure. The Saints uh, go on the road to the Packers. So we're talking about another NFC South, NFC North matchup here. The Packers edging out the Saints by a point, 18 to 17. Kind of a heartbreaker for Bears, Vikings, Lions fans uh, who wanted to see the Packers fall. And they did fall back to earth, Mark, for sure. I mean, Jordan Love came yeah. into the game as the NFL's highest rated passer. And everyone's going, what the hell? This doesn't make any sense. Six touchdowns, no picks. Came back to earth in his first home start here at Lambeau Field. Only 50% completion percentage. But to his credit, leads a comeback. They were down 17 to nothing in the fourth quarter. And they rallied in the final 11 minutes to win this game. Of course, that all comes with the caveat that Derek Carr went down with an AC sprain is what it's being called right now, which is best case scenario. But he's at least probably going to miss a week, if not multiple weeks with that. But once he went down, Jameis Winston came in, almost got them down to score a touchdown. Um, and, and then they, they almost won with a Blake uh, Groupie, I think is his last name, how you pronounce it. Yeah, um, field goal in the end, but he missed a 46 yarder and the Packers hold on to win 18, 17. So kudos to them. They found a way to win in the face of adversity, which is what do you want to see from any NFL team? You know, they're going to face plenty of it throughout the year. Um, rough one for the saints though, especially with Derek going down. Like that's a game that you needed to hang on to. And the defense kind of buckled when it mattered most. I wouldn't even say that as much as that. They they just fell under the the tidal wave of momentum. That Lambeau Field crowd was rocking. Credit to the Packers offense for just finally getting it together. They played like garbage the first three quarters. The field was sloppy. The Love and his receivers weren't on the same page with a lot. Uh, and then finally, Dobbs came up with some big plays late. 
Um, and Jordan Love, to his credit, did the opposite of what he did in fourth quarter last week against the uh, at Falcons where he just laid an egg in the fourth quarter. He was really brilliant in the fourth quarter. And, uh, and, and the Saints, they just felt like they were trying to hold on to something and couldn't do it. And even then, they were in position to kick a game-winning field goal and and you know the kicker missed a you know a forty six yarder uh, on the road at Lambeau. So I still think I leave this game feeling like when healthy, if Derek Carr's playing, the Saints are a better football team than the Packers. They would have won that game. I I truly believe that if Derek Carr had stayed healthy um, and not gotten injured, and the Packers overall are this in this unique space where. They at times, I mean, they were an infirmary yesterday. People talk about the Ravens injuries. The Packers are missing two starting offensive linemen. They haven't had Christian Watson yet. They haven't, they've missed Aaron Jones since halfway through week one. So Jair Alexander didn't play yesterday. So to the Packers credit, sloppy play early. Well, they were running out there with a ton of no-name guys and backup dudes, especially in the offensive line. They had a ton of penalties in the first half. So they battle tested a win's a win. Uh, and uh, you know. Uh, the best thing you I'd take from it if I was a Packers fan is Jordan Love in the crunch time. They got on the same page and he actually looked pretty darn good. Yeah, absolutely. No, he did. He did look good and um, composed would probably be a good word there. You know, yeah, you composed. That, uh, he's a guy that, you know, it's not it's even though it's his first, you know, real season as an NFL starter, he's been in the league for a little bit and seen some things. So for I sure, will well, say that Jordan Love is already really feels like to me, like very much like rookie young Dak Prescott, where he has okay. mobility and he really yeah. can take advantage of his mobility. And there are times when he he picked up a 15 yarder and extended a play on a run down the sideline. He stayed in bounds. That looked like Dak when he was young, right? Where it's like, oh man, this guy can move, but really he's best in the pocket in that 10 to 30 yard range, not exactly a big deep ball thrower, uh, but accurate and really efficient offensively. The key for Jordan Love versus Dak, what we've seen is Dak is seemingly aged really quickly and had some really bad injuries that shattered devastating ankle injury, things like that to where his mobility is very gone now and Dak losing that in his game. He's really lost a, an element. So if Jordan love yeah. can keep this mobility and keep his body healthy, he has a chance in my opinion to really be a Dak Prescott level player so far through a couple games of watching him. That's what it feels like really efficient He's not Aaron Rodgers. He's not just going to burn you on Hail Marys and go routes and deep balls that are just killers. But he does seem like he's a guy who can extend drives, be really just deadly accurate in that system. Again, it's all that same Kyle Shanahan type system that Matt LaFleur runs as well. Sean McVay type of system that is all about play action and knifing you down the field, eight and nine and 10 play drives, just picking up six, seven, eight, 10 yards in chunk plays. Um, if the system stays right and if they if they build the players around him, it looks like they have, you know, like imagine Jordan Love in the Kyle Shanahan offense. Like that's what it feels yeah. like. He's He is that type of player so far, still really early, and the jury's not, the you know, the book's not 100% written, but that's my take early on. And they've been able to do this, and this is why this victory for Green Bay was probably even more meaningful uh, than than most was that they did this without Aaron Jones without Christian Watson Bakhtiari uh, so once once those two come back Bakhtiari uh, those three come back we're talking about Jordan Love having a lot of help uh, already in an offense that you know had been I don't want to say rolling but definitely consistent and showing yeah. uh, the ability to move the football down the field after a short break we are going to discuss the biggest game of the week the Dolphins drumming of the Denver Broncos. What is going on in Colorado and Miami? They are just celebrating uh, like there's no tomorrow. Huge win for them, a record-setting one at that. Uh, we will talk about that on the other side of this break as we pause for a word from our sponsors. Serving the Quad Cities area since 1973, and with over 50 years of excellence on their track record, you'll see why it's so easy to trust their experts when it comes to all of your home improvement projects. This family-owned business has you covered on all your needs. Protect your home or building from the elements today and get great roof repair services. Need new windows? No problem. Durham Remodeling can upgrade your windows and doors. Whether you want to upgrade the little details in your home or office, 
or want to tear a room down and start fresh, the expert contractors at Durham Remodeling have your back. Even the smallest changes can completely transform your space. Ready to start entertaining your friends for backyard barbecues? Durham Remodeling will help you plan, design, and build your deck and patio for the perfect outdoor space. Durham Remodeling's work is 100% guaranteed, so you can rest assured that you're getting the best service around. Call 309-786-6715 today for your free estimate for all your roofing, siding, flooring, windows, and painting needs. That's Durham Remodeling, 309-786-6715. Appreciate the sponsors here on the show and for the Four Frequency Sake podcast network. So very excited uh, to have Durham Remodeling, Christopher Allison, and uh, many other, Ryan Allison tattoos, I should say, and uh, many others on board here for the show. And uh, you can go to fourfantasysakeqc.com to see our full lineup of, of shows. We've got betting, we've got fantasy football, we've got wrestling, racing, all, all the stuff that you can uh, think and want. Uh, we've got the commentary for you, so please go check that out. But, Mark, we continue on with our recap here with the Broncos 20, Dolphins 70, the third highest score ever in NFL history, second highest regular season score, uh, second only to the 1966 uh, Washington and New York game in which Washington scored 72 points. Bears did score 73 in the 40s in one of those championship games. But, yeah, so – that was making history. They also made history with the most yards ever in a single game, 726. And I'm just going to rattle off some stats here because that's really all that this game was about. And it tells the story in a nutshell. Six of the fastest recorded players on the field in an NFL game this year are all Miami Dolphins. <laughs> so all, all, the, all the top six fastest all on Miami. Uh, Devon A. Chan, which is what he wants to be called. Apparently, there was a report. He is not A. Chain. He even told the Dolphins media staff uh, to change the uh, pronunciations in the media guides. It is A. Chan, apparently. Uh, The rookie and Raheem Mostert, uh, the veteran running back, scored four touchdowns apiece. And together, they combined for 375 total yards as Tua goes for 304 and four touchdowns through the air himself. So what a absolute clinic the Dolphins put on offensively, uh, defensively as well as Russell Wilson for the first time in his career starts 0-3 to begin a season. And, you know, it would be remiss if we didn't mention that they could have actually become the highest score in NFL history. But Mike McDaniel took a knee, classy move at the end, said we're not about to, to try and run up the score. That's not what we're here for. Uh, and, and so they, they still hang on to that number two spot, but nonetheless, Mark, uh, all good things for Miami, all bad things for Denver, a really bad loss. And Sean Payton clearly felt that in that post-game presser as well. I'll say this, what I'll just start with this. And I know we'll talk about the bears in a minute, but as soon as the, as soon as the chiefs put their backups in the bears scored points and they picked off Blaine Gabbard. Like as soon as Miami put their backups in. They kept scoring like that, like Denver. And, and I think that says a lot about where this Denver's team is at. Like the psyche of this team is at right now. They are, they're in a bad, bad spot. I mean, the bears were as horrible as you could be yesterday. And, and they couldn't even give up 70 points to uh, the Kansas city chiefs and the best quarterback in the NFL. Like that is, it's insane. Like it is, it, they completely quit. Everyone in that room needs, like they need to, in my opinion, they need to do a firing. They need to do something like you can't just go back to work today and everyone be okay. It's brutal. I mean, it's absolutely embarrassing and brutal and 70 points should never be allowed to happen. Like you just should not exist. Even in today's offensive game, it should not exist. It shouldn't happen. And it's not the Dolphins fault. It, It really wasn't like they weren't like just, Purely put on. They were running they were the trying. ball. Yeah. They were running. What do you want us to do? We they weren't throwing it. It's not like Mike Waite went out there and threw for another 300 yards when he came in as the backup. He was just running the ball, like handing it off, and they kept scoring touchdowns. He on the flip two, side of two that, passes, and I think they were both touchdowns. Because, yeah. Like they didn't throw anything, but when they did, they were touchdowns. Yeah. On the on the flip side of that, 
The Miami Dolphins are obviously extremely good, but here's what I like the most about Miami. Miami has an extremely confident identity. They are physical, but they are the fastest team maybe ever assembled in NFL history. And they're saying, you know what? We're going to throw caution to the wind. We're going to go all in on the fact that this year's Super Bowl is in Vegas in a dome, and we're going to have good weather. Uh, we play in Miami, so we're going to have at least eight of our games in, in at least decent weather, warm weather, hopefully avoid some rain. And then we're going to hope that we can get some home field advantage in the playoffs and maybe win enough games to where we can get the cold weather teams to come down here. And that like that's going to roll the dice. Like that is, It's the same sense of like Buffalo wanting to build their team or Kansas City wanting to build their team in a way that where it's like, Hey, no, the Patriots always did this. The Patriots wanted you to come up to Boston in December and January and be miserable in the snow and for them to dink and dime and run the ball down your throats and just to, to make you quit in the weather. Miami's going to try doing the opposite way. They're going to try and get you down in Miami in January. It's going to be 80 degrees and they're still got guys running four twos all over your ass. Like that's so I give them a ton of credit. For If I was a fan of this team, I'd be so pumped about the identity of my team and the talent they've, they've surrounded that identity with. The other point I'd like to make, at this point in time, I don't remember the last time, and it might be Sean McVay, like the, the, and, and maybe that's it, but even Sean McVay, I don't feel like, had this much hype this quickly about a young guru of a coach coming in and being that successful that quickly. Like Brian Dable last year, uh, did he win coach of the year? He might have. Like everyone loving Brian Dable, yeah, and now did. look at his offense in year two, right? It seems not as creative. It seems a little stale. It seems not as effective, and it doesn't seem to be working. Mike McDaniel's offense from year one, to year one was like, holy crap, this kid's like a professor. He's a little guru. He's smoking weed. He's vaping. He's, 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 you know, an interesting cat, but I'm sure defenses will catch up to him. Not only have they not caught up to him, his offense looks even better, and it now doesn't even look that much like Kyle Shanahan's anymore. It looks more evolved even from Kyle Shanahan's offense. And um, I, I listen, I don't, I don't buy the Dolphins still right now today as a Super Bowl contender because, again, those jerseys in J- January football, I just don't know how it's going to work, right? And Lamborghinis yeah. always have to go in for a tune-up. And someone's going to pull a hamstring. Someone's going to tweak something. And when that happens, this team could fall apart. But they do still have a physical offensive line. And they have an incredible defensive coordinator in Vic Fangio with some dudes on that defense. So Miami is absolutely, um, right now through three weeks, the most impressive team in the NFL. But so much that, again, goes to as a fan. I love the identity. And I love that my head coach has not only just relied on his scheme in year two, it's made, he's improved it. He keeps improving it. This is incredible, incredible coaching from Mike McDaniel, and it needs to be it needs to be addressed. Now, it's, it's still early. Things could fall off the rails, but through three weeks, it's the best coaching in the NFL so far. No question, and they've they've had some different, you know, situations. It's not like, the Dolphins have just everything's just come so easy to them. I mean, yeah, they New England been, held them. They, they, yeah, I mean, they they played a, a, a tough New England team. That's always a, a difficult in division matchup for them. And they started the season against the Chargers, a very talented offense uh, in the league, and and they they had to take them down to the wire and play a very close game there. Uh, so they've won a lot of different ways already this season, and that is usually a good indicator of. Uh, a team's versatility and and their makeup in general and the culture, right? So they we know that they're able to pull out wins in different ways and face uh, various obstacles and still overcome all of those. They're well equipped. Their depth is the biggest question on this team. So if more players do start to go down, that's when they may run into a problem. But for the time being, as long as Tua stays healthy and one of Tyreek or Waddle is healthy for every game, and then you've got several running backs that can dominate in this backfield, uh, you do have some wiggle room there uh, with this team. And yeah, right now, 
Miami and San Fran are like running away with best team in the league. And uh, I, I think Miami is probably number one in that conversation because they just have uh, what I would say is the better quarterback than Brock Purdy. Yeah. And, and you know, but, what's so frustrating is I think that um, Mike McDaniel is just a really unique and special guy. And I, and I, and I know the teams are going to try to find the next Mike McDaniel. I, I, I think there's maybe just, he's a one of one in the sense that he got an opportunity to be taken in by a brilliant football family in the Shanahan family and work with a bunch of other guys who were like-minded, but all similar age and pushed each other with Sean McVay and, and Kyle Shanahan. And he has let his own vibes and personality run with this offense. And like I said, watching that game yesterday, it doesn't even necessarily look like San Francisco's offense anymore. Like even like Matt LaFleur's offense looks still like San Francisco's offense, right? The play action, the role of the quarterback, more physical tight end play. Miami just is starting to look like this unique hybrid of it. And the, and maybe it's just because of the athletes that he has and he's recruited. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, it would make this offense better. Not physical, tough Kyle, you Jusek type players, but Tyree kill type players. And maybe that's what Mike McDaniels, that was his, you know, brilliance on it. May, I don't know, but it, whatever it is, it looks different because of that. Yeah. Yeah. And it, they kind of had remnants of, of the chiefs. I mean, some of the trickery and the, the unique play calls around the line of scrimmage yeah. um, or, or in the, at the goal line, I should say uh, th those, you know, like tosses inside, uh, and, and a lot of misdirection. Yeah, it, it definitely showed the creative element outside of just we're going to beat you on uh, these zone runs because we're better at blocking and better. If you're at the Broncos, really you. quick, final thought: like, what do you do? Like, my, honestly, if I'm the Broncos, yeah, I don't think they can do anything. I that. would fire someone. Like, I would just you'd have to do something. Like, I, in my yeah. opinion, you or like bench someone. Be like, we're bet. Like, you have to find something. In my opinion, you cannot just retrot this back out and I know your favorites now going to Chicago next week and we'll talk about that I'm sure coming up later too but like that is just I mean that's unacceptable like the players have to look at the coach and be like hold some accountability they're going to watch the film and there there's going to be an obvious some one person played worse than others right like someone someone has to get fired or canned or benched yeah. or something just so you can say to yourself all right there's some accountability here and it's not Russ. Yeah, uh, Russ you're, you're didn't right. play yeah. great. Russ didn't play great, but offensively, they they look slightly better than and more consistent than last year. Uh, but you know your defense, my God. Yeah, yeah. No, it was really, really bad. I, I don't know defensively what they can do uh, to turn it around, but I mean, you saw in the locker room afterwards. So many of the Broncos players yeah, were Bowles. just beyond dejected. And, that video is uh, brutal. Bowles talking about how he's been here seven years and all he's done is lost. And uh, yeah, I mean, hell, that could take a toll on an athlete. Like one, you know, a lot of these guys have won in their careers, most of their careers, and come to the NFL, and it's wins are hard to come by. So, yeah, yeah, it's tough for some of those mainstays there in Denver. And I will just say. Because we've been as guilty, I've been as guilty of this. You know, maybe we anointed Sean Payton too much as well. I mean, like there was a lot of it, seven it, and nines in there. There, like, yeah. I mean, he he had an, an all time great in Drew Brees, and they had a lot of winning seasons, but they had a lot of mess seasons too. And just to you know, I, I thought him coming to Denver was going to be an instant like boost and surge, but. I mean, that was, and, and rightfully so, he's getting a lot of flack now for calling out Nathaniel Hackett, talking about how it was an embarrassment. Well, it wasn't that embarrassing. It wasn't 70 points. Wasn't 70 points embarrassing, no. Yeah, yeah. So that was. And Nathaniel uh, Hackett was two and one through three games last year. I heard that today. There you go. That's all. There you yeah. go. Yep, yep. Interesting stuff. So, yeah, they're going to have to turn it around uh, very quickly to at least uh, salvage uh, some optimism in that locker room for sure all right let's move uh to another one with the uh, chargers on the road at the vikings this was a Huge close game. game as opposed to uh the previous one mentioned chargers win 28 to 24 
a battle of the winless teams here trying to avoid 0-3, and, and that will go to the Vikings. Herbert throws for over 400 yards, three touchdowns. Keenan Allen with a career-high 18 catches for 205. He also threw a touchdown to Mike Williams, who unfortunately tore his ACL in this game and is going to be out for the entire season. So the rookie first-round pick, Quentin Johnston, now is going to get instantly thrust into the starting lineup, I would imagine, and have to take on a bigger role. But nonetheless, despite the injury, the Chargers pull out the four-point win. Yeah, Brandon Staley, curiously late in this game, went for it on it's fourth so bad. and one. So bad. His own 24-yard line with the lead. Uh, Joshua Kelly gets stuffed on the run, and that gives the Vikings an opportunity to drive 24 yards and win the game. But the Chargers got the game ceiling interception, so kind of bailed out their head coach there. Uh, the game ceiling interception in the end zone with seven seconds left, and that secured the game there. But Los Angeles avoiding an absolutely monumental collapse for this franchise. They get their first win of the season. Meanwhile, Minnesota now, Mark, one Once score again, games. The one score games. They are now zero and three after yeah. going eleven and one. Yeah, you know, here's the thing. I think um, Vikings fans, right in this morning, have got to be going through it in in a way that's different. Like they're in a similar sense, kind of in between the Broncos and the Bears, right? Like the Broncos, they're going through it because they just invested so heavily in a head coach, and their quarterback is now basically untradeable. Like the the contract yeah. is so bad that if you're not happy with your quarterback, if you're the Broncos, like you're like they're in a world of hurt because they're bad and they don't have a lot of great options to make moves, right? The Vikings are in a world of hurt because they expected to be good. They're bad, but they've all been close losses. So they're not like horrendously bad. You can see the hope, right? And you like your head coach, you like your skill position players. But then your quarterback's on the last year of his deal. And so you're kind of in this, we're not, do we just now go so bad when we get a top pick quarterback? Do we need to, you know what I mean? Like, like so they're in this whole other world of hurt where it's like the Bears are like historically bad and they're not committed to their head coach or quarterback. They can, you know, and they have the picks. So it's like levels of like, of horrendous, all teams 0-3, but in different situations for what they're dealing with. For the Vikings, I, I mean, listen, you have, you've got to find a way if you're the Minnesota Vikings to stop with the crucial turnovers and you've got to find a way at the end of the game to be more organized than that. When the chargers gift you that you have to win that game, like you have to win that yeah. game. And so that's bad. And as for the, as far as the chargers go, Staley, there's, there's two levels of how bad that decision was to go for it. Number one, just like situationally, I get it. If you get the first down, you win the game. Okay. But the play call was a terrible play call, and you're giving it to a backup running back who has not had success all day. I know I started Kelly in my goddamn fantasy over Isaiah Pacheco, <laughs> and I regret oh, yeah. it immediately. Yeah. Immediately. Because I thought to myself, I don't want to watch Isaiah Pacheco run all over my bears and get points. I mean, I bet uh, Kelly will have a bounce back day against a bad Vikings defense. I won't at least have to watch that and 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 be cringe about it. And no, he was hot garbage all day. And then they decided to give it to him again in a very predictable formation, as opposed to Keenan Allen had what eighteen receptions, like just freaking feed Keenan Allen. They can't stop yeah, it. Too, yeah, I mean, you, or you ride do the, the quarterback hand. sneak thing where you're allowed to push with your giant quarterback. Kelly um, had 11 carries for 12 yards. Yeah, I mean, trust me, it was brutal. So there's levels. That was bad in itself. If you're going for it, I at least understand. If you get it, you win. But the play call was horrible, and you shouldn't have gone for it because you could have gotten them to have to drive 80-plus yards probably if you have a good punt with no timeouts, and they have to score a touchdown. Like, yeah. it's not even like field goal to win. They have to score a touchdown. No timeouts, 80 plus yards, and you have studs on your defense and you're a defensive guy. So you're a defensive coach not believing in your own defense. Like it's just bad on so many levels for Staley. And now they lose Mike Williams for the year, but that's why they drafted Quentin Williams. We said on the show, drafting Quentin Williams was so smart because one of them will go down. Quentin Johnston. Quentin Johnston, sorry. One of them will go down. Uh, you yeah. know what I mean? And it happened. And now you just got to hope that the other one stays healthy. And so for that would be Keenan Allen. So now you got to hope that Keenan Allen stays healthy and the Chargers should be okay. 
Yeah, yeah, and they, I mean, it's uh, this team could could use Eckler, uh, you know, right about now. Honestly, um, the good news for them, I guess, is that they go to the Raiders. They could find themselves at two and two and kind yep. of start to start to snap. That's a big these game wins, now but for both teams. That's a big game next week. Now it is, it is, and then it's Cowboys Chiefs for the Chargers. So they, I mean, they really do need to get to two and two so that yeah. they can find their rhythm ahead of two very difficult games coming up, and then after that. Uh, they get a couple uh, easier ones moving forward, but the char this is uh, this is the Chargers, man, and that's the thing is you know you even when they win, it's like man, you you just don't feel confident overall in the group in every you know situation moving forward, and that's why we've said they're kind of like the Cowboys in that way where there's so much optimism and and good things to talk about, yeah, but then there's always that thing where oh, but they just always find a way to fall apart or choke or you know not win one playoff game so look i mean the the chargers are gonna have to do a lot more in the coming weeks um but good on them to escape good on them for bailing out their their coach and and sealing the game with that interception but yes got to be much better moving forward patriots at jets got this game just uh brutal like so boring i don't think anybody wanted to watch this game on top of it the weather wasn't ideal the the paint was bleeding on the field. Guys, um, teeth were falling out. Teeth. That was hilarious. Guys, that was out. such a, <laughs> such a great viral video. That guy, and he knew it as soon as they started to go. And my grandfather, rest his soul, had those bottom dentures too, and they would pop out <laughs> yeah. when they'd go. They go, and they, he knew it. He knew it. Yeah, there's uh, the guy knew instantly for sure. Uh, I guess the good thing for the Patriots here is that it was their 15th win in a row over the New York Jets, so they you know, officially own that team and the Jets can't find a way to, to get a victory there. But yeah, bad weather game. Neither offense looked good. Uh, you know, Quinn and Williams got hurt in the game, you know, defensively, no. it was just kind of like sloppy game. And uh, you kind of anticipated that with the two offenses that were rolling into town, add in the weather circumstances. And it kind of just left us with a meh game. I don't think either of us have uh, many prominent takeaways, but I won't speak for uh, you, so I'll let you kind of take the floor with any comments you may have on this. No, for the Patriots, is a business trip. Get in, play a good defense, keep it smart, keep it keep it downhill, keep it in the hands of your play, uh, of your running backs. You know, three yards in a cloud of dust. Let's get in, get out, get a victory. I think I think Bill Belichick knew that Zach Wilson's not going to beat him. Like he's not going to beat us, so we can't beat ourselves. So they played a very conservative game plan. And that's the Patriot way. They get a W. They move on. They beat the they beat the Jets. For the Jets, they are in that point now where the fans, similar to Bears fans, they're in a similar spot where we both are losers and are and we should not have had expectations, but we both had expectations. And now for different kind reasons, they're away. not living up to the expectations. So now we're angry and we're grasping and we're getting frustrated. And the, the Jets are in a spot, though, where they know they have a roster that is that is that should be better than what it is and built to win. And so I do feel like the Jets cannot put Zach Wilson back out there. I mean, he's so bad. He is terrible. just, like, terrible. Like, not even Justin Fields where it's like, well, no, like, he's got this thing and he's a freak and he, you know, but it's, it's I feel like it's the coaching. Zach Wilson is just bad. Like, he is not. He's not a good quarterback. He's just not it. In the similar way to a lot of small, shifty guys, the Johnny Menzels, they just, it's not working. It's not going to work. So stop it. So if I was a Jets fan, I would be hammering the radio stations today. I'd be, I'd be all over, get me Kirk Cousins. I'd be all over, trade for Russell Wilson for a year. Like, how do we do that? Like, you know what I mean? Like, or, you know what I mean? Or like, a uh, seriously, just go at anything. Me. Like, Just, seriously, go out and get me Jacoby yeah. Brissett. Like, find me someone, anyone Winston, yeah. who can just, yeah, like Jameis Winston, who could just be a professional quarterback because this kid, he can't, he can't do it. He can't do I it. I mean, Andy Dalton that might, might be a, a guy that can go get Andy know, Dalton. Be a good, a good call for you. I mean, yeah. we just saw what, what he did with the Panthers. That the loss, Panthers I, could I use a pick. The Panthers could absolutely use a, a third or fourth round pick. Just throw, like, and for, the only reason I say that is I think it's for the psyche of the franchise. Like I do think Robert Sala and his staff with Aaron Rodgers and this defense like works. And mm -hmm. so I just worry this could get so out of hand, so un uncontrolled that they might be like, do we fire Sala? Do we not like, 
You need to bring someone in there so you can get to that 7-8 win mark, feel good about it, right the ship. Zach Wilson's not getting you to 7-8 wins. He's not. Yeah, and you, you need a guy that can just... Because the locker uh, room, you, know, you see it on the side. Manage. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah, the thing no. is, like, yeah. the, the Bears locker room is not giving up on Justin Fields. You look at the sideline. It's not DJ Moore and them going, dude, this guy can't play. It's not that. They're looking at their coaching staff and kind of folding their arms and going, what's going on here? Like, yep, we kind of told you so. In the Jets, it's different. It's the team looking at the one player going, you're the problem, it's you. Like, so I, in that point, you got to get that cancer out of there. And you got to, you got to, I would I cut him, honestly, just like move on. But you can't, you can't put him back uh, out there. Yeah, I mean. I, I agree they need to do something. They got to go find a backup out, out in the league because that's what – Zach Wilson's a backup quarterback. And Colt McCoy, you, just You want to get McCoy. a better backup quarterback. Yeah. I mean, hey, man, I, I wouldn't even necessarily advocate it in most circumstances, but a, a call to Carson Wentz, it, what, 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 what worse can happen? At this Anyone. Point, you know? Someone but, because the, you're losing the players, and that's bad. Like, it's real yeah, – that's yeah. bad. Yeah, because that just creates uh, you know issues moving into next year when you get Aaron Rodgers back at that yes. point because you you've just you've created uh, you know festering feelings in that locker room that that don't go away quickly. The Bills go on the road and quiet the Washington Commanders who were yeah. starting the season two and one, looking good. All of a sudden, now three weeks in, we forget about that Bills Week One stinker. Uh, the Bills putting up 37 points in a 37 to three route over the Commanders. Uh, Buffalo rushed for 168, uncharacteristic for Buffalo. So that was good to see. They got James Cook going, and uh, Josh Allen had some timely runs himself. Defensively, the Bills sacked uh, Sam Howell nine times, and he threw th- four interceptions. So welcome to the NFL moment for Sam Howell, who is making his what I believe uh, fourth NFL start, maybe yeah. fifth NFL start. And um, Washington now two and one. My whole thing is they've been kind of playing with house money. They got two wins totally. early. I had them at seven wins on the season. I still feel, you know, that they're right around that mark. They're yeah. a tough out some weeks. Uh, but, you know, these are the these are the, you know, little bumps in the road that you're going to get uh, with a young quarterback, a not completely polished roster and, you know, some holes on the team. The other thing that stood out to me when watching this game was how quickly that Washington front has not like it was the scariest thing ever in like 2018, right? I mean, Chase Young, you had Sweat, you had uh, Jonathan Allen, like all these. Allen, you, yeah. You're like, wow, this front is so imposing. Like it's gonna be really hard. Chase Young out there, and he's still starting, but he he just like didn't have the motor at all. Wasn't really running things yeah. down. I wonder if he's still very much hurt. Um, which very well could be the case. I don't know. He's in a contract like, here. The the commanders all around um, are are a tough out. They're a pretty well coached team, but they also ran into a very talented Bills team that they just couldn't keep up with. I mean, at the end of the day, that's what it was: the Bills hitting their stride, and the commanders kind of realizing, okay, we're not at that level uh, just yet. I'll just say this: I really think this is for Buffalo. This is absolutely now they've two weeks in a row got off a lot of frustration and are playing extremely good football since that Monday night loss. And we haven't seen them. They haven't been on national TV since that ugly loss. And so I think people are still undervaluing the bills. And after that week, they had two win against the Raiders. And I think this is another example for them. But listen, we just went on the road and we just completely outclassed and dominated the upstart commanders. And so I think it's a reminder to everyone, hey, that clash against the Dolphins next week, that's for a lot of the marbles early on here. And um, uh, the Dolphins may be the hottest team in football right now, but the Bills two weeks in a row with the way their offense is playing and their defense is showing their teeth might be the second hottest. Uh, just yeah. And so as far as the commanders go, yeah, you know, Sam Howell showed some things that were really concerning, but again, you're giving him the season. He gets the season. So this is just another piece, a data entry point into the the weighing the positive and negatives when the outcome comes to the season for Sam Howell. But this was certainly a, a bad negative. You'd like to say, hey, there would be a moment where you say to your young quarterback, they're just beating us right now. You're clearly not seeing it. 
So let's just move the ball, stop turning it over. Let's run it. Let's check down. But they didn't do that. And even when they tried, he still was making bad decisions with the football. And that that's a concern. But you got to give him now the, all right, look at it, read it, coach it up, get back to it. Uh, so we'll see. He did flash the athleticism with a really nice run with a couple spin moves and a juke inside the red zone. So, I mean, he's, yeah, he's a, He's, he's definitely like solid, you know, uh, he reminds me a little bit of a, maybe a little bit more athletic Baker Mayfield. Um, yeah. I like him more field. than Ritter. Uh, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like you, yeah. you like him more than Ritter. And um, I, as of right now, I like him more than Bryce young from the young quarterbacks. I know the last two years, but like Bryce, you haven't seen much out anyways, and he's already injured. And, and so uh, we will talk about the other young quarterback. I don't like him as much as CJ Stroud though. Yeah, yeah. No, it's CJ Stroud and the Houston Texans uh, put on a show against the Jacksonville Jaguars. This one really shocked me, and I guess it shouldn't have because the, the Texans have won 16 of 19 in the series and 10 of their last 11 against the Jaguars. Divisional games, about, man. Never bet crazy. divisional games. <laughs> and right, yeah. I mean, the Jaguars always have the Colts number, and the Texans apparently always have the Jaguars number. I didn't realize it until looking this up, but yeah, CJ Stroud, incredibly efficient. This is the type of game that you need to give. I've been talking about, we, we, we've been talking about the pass attempts, 20 of 30. That's in the, that's in the range there you go. Where, where you're fine with 20 of 30, 280, and two touchdowns for him. And, you know, Stroud now becomes the third player ever in NFL history. I know this gets in the weeds of things. And it's kind of funny when you talk about NFL stats where they're just finding a stat for everything, but, I think it's somewhat telling. He's the first quarter, third quarterback in history to have 900 or more passing yards in his first three NFL games. Uh, the only other two were Cam Newton and uh, Justin Herbert. So some good company there to begin with. Obviously, they're trusting him with a lot. But one of the cool things out of this game, Mark, was NFL history being made here as well. Andrew Beck, the Jags uh, yes. fullback, right to the Texans fullback, uh, became the heaviest player in NFL history to return a kickoff for a touchdown, an 85-yard touchdown in the third quarter, uh, 255 pounds, and he reached 20 miles an hour on this kick return touchdown. How about that? Give it up for the big man. You know, I love that. That highlight was amazing. I will say this. I was shocked by this. The Jags, as you know, I predicted them to be a 14-win team. I really thought they would be the team that built – on the success of last year. And now that's the dolphins. Like the dolphins are doing what I thought the Jags would do, where they just have a second year, the system, the momentum, adding the players and boom, that growth step. Right. And so far we have not seen it. I mean, uh, since week one, it's been bad, bad quarterback play, um, really shaky defensive play, bad special teams plays, uh, bad in the red zone and, um, credit to the Texans, because this is, I'm going to use the Texans later on as an example, but they have a young rookie coach and their defense goes on the road against a, a really talented third year player who's got a ton of weapons and they hold him to 17 points on the road. And, and while doing it, he's a defensive coach that allows his offense, his offense according to play play action running guys under the center. You know what I mean? A physical brand of football, not just spread RPOs and and uh, and uh, bubble screens left and right everywhere. And oh, what'd you know? You score 37 points and your quarterback looks pretty darn efficient. I think you know where I'm building my case towards of what I'm going with this, but it's really empowering to see, especially because that quarterback goes to a school that apparently can't produce good NFL quarterbacks, which I think You're is right. just malarkey. Um Happy for C.J. Stroud. Uh, we both said that C.J. Stroud was our number one quarterback in this last class. He so far has looked head and shoulders above the other two in just the sense that he's remained healthy. He's not turning the ball over, and they're asking him still to do a lot. And uh, and he and, and he's showing up. And kudos to him getting his first win on the road uh, with not a lot of help around him offensively. Absolutely. Really really good looking uh, day for CJ Stroud and that Texans and the Jaguars. They have a tough schedule. Now, again, remember when we talked about the Jaguars and building them, in my opinion, to a 14 win team before the season, 
it's workable because a lot of the tough games were at home. But if you're losing at home to division rivals by 20 points, yikes. Like, it's not a good start for the Jags. Yeah, that's this has been a, a really rough start for them. The offense just has not been able to string together consistent performances, even from drive to drive. And, you know, another glaring thing yet again, I mean, I said this last week, their inefficiency in the red zone has continued yeah. to come back. I mean, they had a, a missed field goal in their first drive. Uh, then they were like three and out. Then it was a, a blocked field goal. And then it was a, a turnover. It's just they're not converting uh touchdowns and it's obviously a big problem for a Doug Peterson offense with all of the talent that they have I'm still confident they will find their mojo they'll turn things around at some point here uh but that is why I was a little reluctant with them I mean we have differences we both had them winning the south but that's why I had them more as a 10 win team was because just the difficulty of putting it all together uh that quickly in one season I felt like there was still, you know, like next year might be that year that I hope that they will get to that, um, you know, elite uh, class of team yeah. in the league. But And I still feel by the end of this year that they're going to be a totally different team. They're going to be clicking on all cylinders. You just want it to start happening soon because, like you said, you can't oh, really at home afford already. too many of these losses to the Texans and things like that. Uh, the Chiefs loss you can handle. Uh, the Texans won much harder to swallow. And on top of it, they were down 17 nothing at the half. I mean, they put themselves in a position where they had to com completely uh, abandon the run and and fight back uh, with everything that they had. So, yeah, a, a lot not going right for the Jaguars the last two weeks. Texans uh, looking very competent. And as you said, the rookie quarterback who's working with the fewest weapons is the one that's doing the best. Go figure. Uh, the Colts go on the road in an overtime game against the Ravens and pull out a victory here. Matt Gay with four field goals over 50 yards in this one, including the game winner in overtime. No one seemed to want to win that game. Went back and forth and then uh, late in overtime, Ravens try and go for it on fourth down and it was an incomplete pass. Questionable no call by the refs. Yeah, uh, That ends up leading to the game winning field goal there for the Colts. Lamar got back to the rushing Lamar that we've seen in the past. He put up 100 yards, two touchdowns, looked really good. I mean, honestly, I thought the Ravens offense for the most part looked pretty good. It, it was another kind of situation of not converting things into enough touchdowns. They only scored 19 points in an overtime game. Uh, but, you know, really it was two teams kind of, you know, fighting and clawing for every inch that they could get. And it was just the Colts that were the ones – uh, that ended up pulling out on top for this one. From an uh, AFC North perspective, you know, Steelers fans, Bengals fans, Browns fans, all very happy uh, that the Ravens dropped this one because that division still kind of remains wide open now at this point with the Ravens. Had an opportunity to kind of start to run away with it early in the season. Yeah. Uh, meanwhile, the Colts are, I mean, man, no Anthony Richardson, Gardner Minshew here. They're, they're showing that they're a tough out and they're a team that's, you know, not going away just because they have a rookie quarterback and a backup quarterback starting games for them. They are they're very much uh, in this thing. All of this, by the way, without Jonathan Taylor. So tough loss for the Ravens. Colts should be encouraged. But I think uh, I don't really think either team we could have too many takeaways uh, for this one. Rough weather early in the day for them. And uh, Baltimore will will be just fine, I think. Indianapolis is well coached. It's as simple as that. The rookie Shane Steichen has showed up and he's got game plans. They're working. Uh, he doesn't have a ton of talent, but he's maximizing the most of his talent. He's, whoa, this is a shocking thing. I didn't know you could do this. He's actually customizing his game plans to fit around his talent. His personnel. Which is wild. Yeah. Like, how can you go? You can't have two more different quarterbacks than Minshew and Anthony Richardson and yet. Both can look really good in a, in an offense. I I, I mean, I, I didn't know that was possible, that you could actually just, you know, customize based on the players you had. I thought you just had to yeah. run a system no matter what the system was, and that's just how it was. Um, but uh, anyways, I will say, so that's my point of the Colts. I think they're well coached, and they're going to they're gonna be feisty. They're going to win more games, I think, than we both predicted be, because of this. They're going to be feisty. They're going to stay involved with stuff. And honestly, Gardner Minshew... He might actually be the best backup quarterback in the NFL, like a true 
yep. backup quarterback yep. to well. come in, win you a couple games while your starter's down, that type of guy. If Anthony as as Richardson Ra- wasn't hurt, I would say if you're the Jets, go get Gardner Minshew. But the thing is, I don't think the Colts are willing to give. No, give the Colts want to keep him in building. He, yeah. he was brought there with Steichen because he was with Philly to like help and run the system and know the offense. Absolutely. And for the Ravens, the injuries really showed up to me today. Like they didn't play last week because of the divisional game. They knew each other. But like this week, you clearly could tell they were missing people. It just made it out of sync for them with the weather. Lamar, I thought, was more vintage Lamar, but I think he was that's the problem. He was missing Odell Beckham, like that Odell Beckham missing yeah. the game, like the, that full high flying offense that they're trying to do, just it couldn't get off the ground. Not worried about the Ravens yet. Tough loss, ugly loss, but not worried about them yet. Yeah, they it's still plenty of time and and they have looked good and in uh, offensively in, in most of the games they've played. So yeah, they'll, they'll turn it around. Uh, I think we're both confident in that Panthers go on the road at Seattle and the Seahawks run away with a 10 point victory, 37, 27, yeah. probably a little bit closer than the Seahawks would have uh, liked uh, in this one. Andy Dalton getting the start for the injured Bryce young and, he looked very good, but man, they had him throw 58 passes in this game. They're like, Hey Andy, uh, you, you haven't thrown passes in an NFL game for a couple Get of off years. The bench. You know? like, uh, yeah, yeah. Come, come out here and, and, t- and toss a bunch for us. Uh, but he looked pretty good for them, you know, helped them move the ball at times, but really it was the balanced attack by Seattle, which I think now they're, now they're starting to like get back into the stride, right? Like they're running the yeah. football the way that they were able to last Kenneth year. Kenneth Walker, Kenneth two Walker. tutties. Yeah. Uh, you know, they got Charbonnet involved, uh, you know, and, and Gino seemed much more comfortable than the, he has the last couple of weeks getting the ball in the hands of his playmakers. We still haven't seen that breakout game from Jackson Smith and Jigba. And so, I mean, I think that's a great sign. Like Seattle is, still has room to improve and still guys yeah. that can come out and, and, and make big plays for them. So, yeah, I mean, what this boiled down to was Seattle's obviously the better team in this matchup and you expected them to win. They got a double digit victory. Panthers, meanwhile, they're just not, don't have much going for them personnel wise. Uh, their defense is their bread and butter, but once their defense is out there for, you know, 80 minutes, it's difficult to, to, to stop a, a good offense like the Seattle Seahawks. So that's really all this boils down to. You just hope that Bryce Young can get back out there and get him reps because that's what the season's about at the end of the day. Get, get your young guy reps, get him more comfortable, and then go get him some reinforcements. Yeah. I would say that that's a great point. You ended on there for the Panthers. This was a chance for them to steal a victory. You know, the Panthers don't have yeah, a first round pick three, next you know, year. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I, you know, I, I'm gonna remind myself of that. They don't have a first round pick <laughs> next don't. year. So you're not the idea of like, oh, just tank, tank. It doesn't necessarily apply to you. I know you want your high second round pick and all this or whatever, but like in the end, it's this year has got to be a culture building and getting your young quarterback confidence and experience and all that, right? while also trying not to get him killed. And for the Seahawks, they they avoided one of the biggest trap games ever. At home, backup quarterback, bad team, and you hang on for a 10-point victory, you will take that, you'll walk away, you've scored 37, your offense looked good, and so you just swallow that, you move on, and you say, okay, a little closer than we wanted to be, but we avoided the trap game, right? We avoided what the Ravens fell. The Ravens lost at home to a backup quarterback. The, uh, the the Seahawks didn't, so kudos to them, well-coached team, avoiding that pitfall. Absolutely. There's something to be said for that, for sure. I mean, just you, you got to win the games you are supposed to win uh, because wins are not guaranteed in the NFL, and we've seen that time and time again. All right. Uh, the Bears go on the road to the Chiefs, and it was not good. It did not saw go murder. well. For it was a murder. Chicago. Uh, the, the highlights for this one, uh, I'm going to have to put on the objective hat real quick here, Mark. So uh, yeah. forgive me, but Andy Reed did become the fourth all time, yeah. uh, leader in wins passing Tom Landry, uh, with, uh, let me see what the exact one, Seven, was 271? 271, 271, a lot of victories there for Andy Reed, a uh, big day for, for Travis Kelsey, uh, with, with his girlfriend on hand, um, Really, what I mean, if you're just talking about box score standouts, Chicago 11 first downs, Chiefs 31 first downs, 20 more than the Chicago Bears in this one. As Fields goes 11 for 22, 
for 99 yards, a touchdown and a pick. Um, all around pretty rough day for Chicago. I will yield the floor to you, sir. So I'll start with the Chiefs. Again, the Chiefs did exactly what they needed to do, right? A, an opponent comes in here that is a, a, a un, underachieving, kind of a mess disaster, and you avoid the pitfall, right? You come out, you play your game, big plays early, getting huge stops on third downs early, putting up touchdowns, and you're up, you know, uh, by uh, by 34 to nothing at halftime, and the game is over. Like, you did exactly what you needed to do, and that's a huge credit to the Chiefs, especially when they put on their own self-pressure of having Taylor Swift in the stadium to watch them. Like, you bring that on yourself, and you still perform at that high level. Like, huge kudos to the Chiefs. And um, I will say, I think that... If you're a Chiefs fan, the one thing you have to look at is you say to yourself, the only thing that's still a slight concern is that even through all of this, the Chiefs wide receiver core still to me doesn't look like it is the type of wide receiver core that helps continue this dynasty last for forever. But they have shown they've shown vast improvement from week one, right? So mm -hmm. it's incremental. And you say to yourself, okay. If this is what the wide receiver core is and Kelsey's healthy, then this team is Super Bowl caliber. Caliber. But if they have bad games, we've seen the wide receiver core literally lose them a game already. So you kind of are always living on that line. But the Chiefs defense is young. It's it's terrific. Carl Loftus, Jones, uh, uh, I mean, you know, just terrific right now. Yeah. I'll turn my head to the Bears. We said on this show on the uh, on the the preview episode and that midweek thing when we were talking about the Bears, they had to find a way to make sure this wasn't an embarrassment, and they knew that was their objective, and it was an absolute embarrassment. It was a shellacking. It was a you you are, um, I think Barstool Big Cat said it best. Um, the 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 Chicago Bears have turned into the team that you invite your girlfriend to for homecoming because you know you're going to put up big stats. Like you, you, They're the scheduled FCS team you schedule for homecoming. Alabama versus, you know, Campbell State and, you you know, UTF Austin and you just beat them up on homecoming and you put up big numbers and you go all and have party and get laid after the game, right? Like, so <laughs> that is reality of what happened. Like, that is the reality. The, you are absolutely incoherent and incompetent. And when your team is that bad, um, Clay Harbor had the tweet and I wanted to share it because I think this drives home the point really well. When you're a defensive head coach and you can't figure out a way to not give up 25 points in 13 straight games, that's a problem. And that is a legit problem. And the Bears defensive personnel this year is much better than last year. Much so even better. if you count, if even if you discount the games last year and you're just on a three game losing streak, giving up 25 or more points, the rookie D'Amico Ryan's head coach against a good Jaguars offense on the road with less talented personnel gave up 17 points this weekend. Like at some point in time, I am I am just fully now in on and t unless I see drastic changes and the Bears. This is true. Like you got to state the facts. They will get guys back in the coming weeks. Tevin Jenkins, the offensive line, should get better in the next two weeks. They have a much easier schedule in the next three four weeks. So they have an opportunity here to turn things around, but unless things. Until I actually see it, I am a hundred percent in on. I would. I'm okay with keeping Ryan Poles. He didn't hire Matt Eberflus. He really didn't. He was told that Matt Eberflus is the guy. He had one interview with Matt Eberflus. It's like, all right, they the organization paid Bill Pullian half a million dollars to find a head coach. He found a head coach. We're gonna roll with this. I think Matt. I think that Ryan Poles is a capable GM who understands football as a former player. I, I I do. I like the moves that Ryan Poles has made, getting DJ Moore and the, the savvy he's he's had. At this point in time, I am 100% out on the Bears coaching staff from top to bottom. Luke Getze had a chance to be the savior because he was the one guy who made the changes, right? Who said, our offense is going to go from this crappy thing 
Monday Night Football, we debut a new offense, and now we score points. That He was the savior, and he had all offseason to build on that, and he made it way worse. And now you have a quarterback who had shown all this promise who's way worse. And and so I'm out. On, I'm, I'm just completely, at this point in time, I am out on Matt Eberflus and Luke Getze. I'm done with them. Like, that is, they. I would fire them today. If it was me, I would just fire them because you have opposing players, as we mentioned the last episode. You have a, like they're calling out the 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 staff saying you're not using the players right. Like the players don't lie. Yeah. Justin Fields yeah. and the players were hugging each other at the end. They had this weird like, "Hey, we're in this together, guys." Like it does. It seems as though everyone in 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 that building, players wise, are looking around going like, "Like, what do you want us to do?" Yeah. Like I can't yeah. audible every play. And defensively, they are not competitive, and you have a defensive head coach, and you added a lot of talent in the offseason to that defense. So that is my that is my overall view. They are they are the worst coach team right now in the NFL. Like and if you watch the film, it's just it's not deniable. Even Sean Payton has improved the Broncos offense. They are scoring more, right? Like he's controlling his side of the ball. Like the Bears are the worst coach team in the NFL. And and so that is obviously like there's there's no way out of that for me without changing the coaching staff. Some whole the problem changes. therein lies then you also will at this point look like you're gonna end up having two of the top five picks in the NFL draft. And then what do you do with the quarterback position? Because I still believe in Justin Fields. I really do. I know it's it maybe dumb to say. I fell in love with the guy, and maybe that's the stupid thing. You can't fall in love with the players. But he has shown, even on the deep balls, like the DJ Moore drop deep ball, the couple, like, this dude is different. Like, he can, I unlike Zach Wilson, I really think Justin Fields can play quarterback at a high yeah. level in this, in this league. I really do. But this offense is extremely poorly coached, and they're not good right now. And, they, and the offensive line is not good, and they're poorly coached. And that is a... The first time the recipe for disaster. The first time I have seen the Chicago Bears run a slant pattern to DJ Moore in the regular season was on that touchdown pass late in the game in garbage time. Why? Why? Yeah. Yeah. Like why? Like that I mean, why? Like offensive football doesn't have to be in the shotgun with a back to your right or your left or spread out no back. Line the kid under center. Get into eye formation every once in a while. But you know how much we talked about Robert Tunyon in the offseason? Yeah. Where's right. Robert Tunyon? <laughs> where is he? Yeah. Where where uh, is he? They were they were, oh my god, Robert Tunyon, this the coaches have Robert Tunyon. Where is he? Luke gets he had him in Green Bay. We have, we don't run any power tight end sets. So when so Again, the on I'm putting all this out there to basically say, what does it matter? I don't know. But I, as a Bears fan and as a person who is paid to talk about sports and analyze it in, in my show and, and, and we do this show, and it, objectively, I'm going to sit here and say, in the end, it probably doesn't matter. I think you stick with the GM. You let him go get a guy offensively, a new coach, and you're going to get probably a new quarterback and all that, right? Start over. But I will defend Justin Fields. I truly believe this is a case of co horrific coaching malpractice from the offensive and defensive, uh, the, the, your head coach and your offensive coordinator. It's malpractice. It's terrible. And um, uh, and it is as bad as it can get in Chicago. The Bears are three-point underdogs at home to the Denver Broncos. The Denver Broncos just gave up 70 points on the road. And the Bears are underdogs to the Broncos. <laughs> Vegas knows. That's I all mean, you need is, to see. That's all you need to say. Like, that's how yeah. bad it is for them right now. And yet, they have a chance to turn things around. And if you're at Eberflus, I mean, you are literally coaching, at this point, not only for your head coaching job, like, do you want to be a coordinator again? Like, do you want to get hired again? Because that's now what you're coaching for. Because it is that, it's that ugly. It's that bad. Same with Luke Getze. Like, you're coaching now for your job. Like you're absolutely doing that. And um it, it is it is ugly in Chicago. It's ugly, ugly. But I want it on the record. I'm firmly in the camp of I believe it's coaching. I believe the talent yeah. is there to be successful. 
And I do believe that if it was up to me, I would keep Brian Poles and let him actually, him and Kevin Warren, try to actually hire a staff. Kevin Warren wasn't involved in getting Poles and 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 uh, Eberflus. Poles was barely involved with getting Eberflus. It wasn't them. Now say no more hiring Bill Poley and outside the horse sources to find the next coach. Kevin Warren and Ryan Poles, I believe, could can influence this organization in a way. The key will be, do they do they stick with Fields or not? And at this point, it doesn't look like they are, just because uh you're gonna have the you're gonna have the draft capital to go get who you want. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. They are gonna have the the capital to do uh, pretty much whatever they want with those picks next year. Yeah, that now that's a great point. And I, I won't bo- um, you know, go too much deeper into this game because, you know, it is what it is, as you've said, pretty much all that needs to be said. But, you know, it, it did make me think of uh, just potential candidates out there. And I'm like, you know, Brian Flores with this uh, Bears defense would look pretty cool. Um, but Well, his defense stinks again, in Minnesota. You know, I don't want. I'm well, not, that's true. That's true. I but I, they be, have like no, they have no players to remember when we were going through the Bears coaching search. I was, ve- I wanted Brian Dable. I was vehemently yeah. against a defensive guy. They hired a defensive guy. I, they cannot do it. Like they can't do yeah. it. Like you yeah, can't you do it. it. It's, it is, it, it is. It is so stupid right now to do something like that. I'm sorry. It just is, especially with how bad your football team has looked. And Eberflus was sold to us as the guy who would come in and be like, just be a man culture. and culture. culture. Yeah. And we're going to make this team respectable again after the clown show that Matt Nagy. Matt Nagy won coach of the year. And Matt Nagy did not lose 13 straight football games, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. No, and the defense looked uh, certainly a, a heck of a lot better under uh, Nagy and uh, and and his coaching regime. So for sure, that's a point well taken. And you know, I I don't want to like overstate the point that we've made, but you've got a really bad Broncos team on the horizon, uh, a certainly gettable Commanders team after that. I know it's, it's Vikings so, Raiders. Like it's maddening. There is a there is a world in which the Bears find themselves at four and three. Going into the Chargers, the there world is. where that exists. The is only way that, that happens. The I only way that happens is if Luke Getze puts his pride aside and runs the offense that he ran after that Monday night game last year. And like DJ Moore in the slot slant route, slant route. Like why was it? The, why did it take until the end of the third game in a blowout to run a simple offensive concept? For your young quarterback who is not never going to be Tom Brady, who's right. never going to be Aaron Rodgers. At his best, he's going to be Lamar Jackson, who needs things in his face, simplified and structure. So again, it's just so it's malpractice. It's coaching malpractice, Dan. Doing him a big disservice for sure. I I feel for you and all my Bears fans, uh, friends out there, brothers and sisters. I uh I feel for you. And then the Steelers aren't too much better, uh, but we'll get to that. Finding uh, ways in, to win in, games. In a few games. They are finding ways to win. That is for sure. Uh, but before that, we'll get to the uh, last of the afternoon battles, the the Cowboys at the Cardinals, and the Cardinals pulling out a win here against Dallas. Oh, you hate to see it, but you love to see it. 28-16, to 16, Cardinals victory over the Cowboys. Josh Dobbs and James Conner stealing the show, and – got to give props to Dobbs the former Steeler first career win as a starter in the NFL 28 years old and uh the Cardinals never trailed in this game Mark that was a huge a point of emphasis here and you know Dak Prescott just very much of the Dak Prescott that we expect to see 25 of 40 249 yards a touchdown and a pick that's kind of Prescott's career and that's that's why we I, that's why I even after the Cowboys put up great performances the past two weeks, we were like, I don't know, it's the Cowboys still. And we felt this last year when they had a run, and yeah. we're like, Yeah, they're looking good, but they're the Cowboys still. Like at the end of the day, doesn't matter if you get rid of Callan Moore, doesn't matter if you uh you know get rid of Jason Garrett and bring in Mike McCarthy. Uh the personnel is the personnel, and Dak Prescott for as as quality of an NFL quarterback as he is has a cap and he doesn't go past that cap. It just doesn't happen. It's very Kirk cousins. And that's what we're seeing here. 
Uh, no Trayvon Diggs hurt the Cowboys, definitely. Uh, but to give up 28 points after the performance that your defense has put up the last two weeks uh, against one of the worst teams in the league, if not the worst team in the league, brutal for the Cowboys. And the 13 penalties for 107 yards was just icing on the cake for a, a really just a perfect storm for Dallas in a, in a very underwhelming performance there in the desert. But kudos mm-hmm. to the Cardinals. Big win for them. Yeah, I will say as far as the Cowboys go, I mean, this is this is exactly what we said last week. The Cowboys offense hasn't had to do anything yet. And now today, their defense had a bad day after missing and losing their superstar, one of their two superstars for the year. Their offense was asked to do something to help them win a game, and this is what you get. So we... I expect to see more of this type of thing for the Cowboys now, up and down. There's going to be games where that defense finds its teeth again. It's really well coached. They still have a lot of star power beyond digs, and they're going to dominate some people. And then the next game is going to be a game where, because it's the NFL, defense doesn't have it, offensive team, and they really shock some people. They took the Cardinals for granted. Cardinals schemed really, really well. I think it does bear warning that Gannon, the head coach of the Cardinals, has spent time in Philly the last two years. Like he knows the he knows the Cowboys from his time with the Eagles. I think he had a really good game plan for his defense against this team. So that I expect the Cowboys to do a lot more of this up and down this year, kind of floating back and forth, win one, lose one, win one, lose one, because of this now the Trayvon Diggs injury and Dak Prescott being who Dak is for the Cardinals. Here's the big question you got to start saying to yourself. This feels like the type of win now that will change the momentum for them to be a team that now stays scrappy. Kyler comes back and actually plays at some point, and now they're a team that's going to use their two high picks to draft a lot of maybe talent and and just and load up on some talent or trade one of those high picks to someone who wants a quarterback. Like this, it, it feels like this is a season changing like momentum win now. If they go back to being stinky and they lose the next three straight, maybe they they go back into full tank mode or whatever. But this has that feeling where it could be a momentum swinging win, depending on where sure. where the culture of the team goes and what they do next. I I don't have their schedule in front of me. I don't know what's what's next for them, but that's what I'd say for them. Right now, it doesn't mean much except for the fact of where it takes you. Is it just a one off? You beat the Cowboys, fell good. So you don't you don't go over in the season, or is this a hey, we are more scrappy than we thought? Let's hang around and get Kyler back and see what this team looks like with Kyler Murray. I don't know. I it, it's it was so shocking of a win that it yeah. led to that type of feeling for me. If I was a Cardinals fan, I wouldn't know what to think if I was a Cardinals fan either. Tough uh, horizon for the Cardinals. They oh, play really? the 49ers and the Bengals the next two weeks. So they uh, probably so go look, back. If Joe to Burrow's losing. not there. So they'll be um, one in four. See, yeah. depending on how bad they lose those games. Yeah. So who knows? They probably yeah. should stay in tank mode and try to get Caleb Williams, but who knows? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, once they get Kyler Murray back, they're definitely a, a much different team. And for the the Cowboys, it's the Patriots and then the 49ers, Chargers, Rams. Like they're not, they're not getting any like instant gimmies uh, over yeah. the next few weeks too. So Cowboys uh, need to respond to that loss quickly. Final game of the weekend. Uh, before these two Monday night games that we have I've been waiting up. for this one from you. Yeah, Steelers uh, pull out a gutty 23-18 win over the Raiders. Uh, it was much closer than it needed to be. It seemed like the Steelers were in control for uh, the vast majority of this game. They were down 7 nothing, and then scored 23 unanswered points. Uh, felt like they were really at a stranglehold in this one. Uh, Jimmy G, after the game, evaluated now for a concussion, so we'll see yeah, what happens tough. with him moving forward. That's a tough one. Uh, the, the Steelers got three interceptions off Jimmy G un, uncharacteristic performance for Jimmy from that perspective. Um, and, and they were able to, uh, to get multiple sacks, uh, on, on Garoppolo in this game too. So, I, I mean, I'll speak to both sides of the ball here for the Steelers perspective, because for the Raiders, I felt like, you know, they let one get away that when they could have gotten into it late, um, we'll talk about just that horrendous call at the end of the game to, to kick yeah. a field goal when you're down eight. Uh, instead of just try and tie the game. Uh, that was very bizarre. I feel like the Steelers got away with one there a little bit. Um, bad ref game, too, I will say. But, you know, that's neither here nor there. Um, you know, Steelers were, I, I, I'm worried that they're, you know, they're 
forming an identity of of a feast or famine type of situation where they're just going to be you know a bit a two big plays a game and then the rest is uh you know really hard to come by i would still like to see much more consistency out of them you know I was saying going into this after how poor the offense was the first two weeks that i felt you know what what this offense needed to be confident in moving forward was definitely to run the football with more consistency which they did in this game to an extent but really i felt that they needed to score like 34 points against such a bad raiders defense for it to feel good because it was so bad the first two weeks that I felt you needed a complete reverse where you just knock the socks off of this team and really get rolling. They didn't quite get to that point. And so for all the optimism that I have that, you know, steps have been taken the last two weeks for this offense, it just doesn't feel like it's happening at a quick enough pace is something I would like. And they still weren't able to run the football very effectively, but it was much better. So I can't, it's it's hard. It's hard to feel, uh, you know, strongly one way or the uh, the other about this team because I I did think Kenny uh, commanded the offense a little bit better. I thought he saw the field better, made better decisions overall. So it's like, whatever. I'll take it. It was a win too. So, you know, good stuff defensively. Uh, I just feel like their cornerbacks are going to be a liability uh, throughout the season. I, I Adams had a big have, game. Adams had a massive, you know, career game. Uh, opposing number ones have have kind of notoriously destroyed the Steelers, and they really haven't had a top tier corner uh, since Ike Taylor. Really, you know, uh, in terms of outside cornerback, and it's been a while. And so, hopefully, Joey Porter Jr., who's been given limited snaps these past few weeks, I, I think that they he deserves some more playing time to see what they got in the, in there because that pass rush is lethal. Um, and and they've been more opportunistic as a defense in general. Eight takeaways in the first three games uh, from Alex Kazora, friend of the show. We've had him on before. Tweeted out the last time the Steelers had this many takeaways in the first three games was in 2010, 2008, and 2005. And you know what happened those years? Steelers went to the Super Bowl. So there you go. Steelers going to the Super Bowl here in 2023. Uh, but no, all joking aside. It's a win. I'm not going to fault them too much. It was on. They were on the road. Felt more like a home game too. A lot of Steelers fans there. Um, but a little discouraged that they let the Raiders come back in it. And yeah, in, in at the three minute mark, you're Josh McDaniels. It's fourth and four from like the five or whatever it was, and he goes and kicks a field goal uh, to to bring him within five points. So you still need a touchdown when you could have tried to go for the touchdown and the two point conversion to tie it. It just didn't make sense, and they gave the Steelers really the opportunity there to run down the clock, and then they get the game ceiling interception, you know, with uh, with twenty seconds left on the clock or whatever to go. So terrible call by McDaniel's there. Uh, I felt like the Raiders had a lot of momentum, probably could have tied that game there, uh, but instead, you know, Steelers hang on for the victory. So I'll take it. They're two and one, have an opportunity to stack some wins now, uh, and, and meanwhile for the Raiders, just. Yeah, a really tough way to lose because you were in that game and and they had it. Uh, they 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 had all the momentum at the end. Yeah, never apologize for the win. Absolutely, and I will say your defense is playing really good. Besides the fact that they can't stop the number one. I mean, this the yeah. sacks, getting yeah. after the quarterback, uh, making it really tough on him. I will say the thing that to me is frustrating if I'm a Steelers fan too is just the absolutely right the consistency of the offense to where it's like hey if we just can control the clock more and we can we can get easy scores this defense can feast like they can rush the quarterback you want to put the opposing team in those situations um to let tj watt just get after the quarterback right and it, it just feels like the steelers at times when they did that and they had a nice lead in the fourth quarter then they just Fell apart, and they let the they the, you know the corners the back end of the defense they were just failed gassed, them. You know, and, it's like yeah, and it was and it almost cost them the game. McDaniel's obviously that is the I mean that is analytics one hundred and one. Analytics came to the league ten years ago, and ever since then, you absolutely know every fan knows it now. Too fans aren't dumb anymore. Uh, there's a lot of dumb fans, but for the majority of fans who are on the Twitter, are yes. gonna who are gonna. The, the the reporters all know it now too. 
the analytics say you absolutely have to go for it. And that's even one of those cases where before analytics, you just say, we don't have much time left. We just got to yeah. tie this game. We got to try like yeah, make intuition a stand. plays a part. And you're down so big. The fact that you got yourself in that spot to come back to have a chance, you got to go. Like you got to try right there. You have momentum. So brutal, brutal decision making from him. You would still need a touchdown. It never makes sense to kick a field goal if you still need a touchdown. You need to get touchdowns. All right. Like that is what the game is about at that point in time. The Raiders, I don't think the Raiders, again, I don't think the Raiders are as bad as we thought at the beginning of the year to start the year. But again, we also predicted Jimmy G is going to miss time. That's Jimmy G. Looks like he's going to miss time. Could this be a, a moment where the season really starts to kind of fall apart for the Raiders? Then what do they do from there? This was a bad loss because I think the locker room doesn't trust the coach after a loss like that. And you lose your starting quarterback maybe for a game. So that could this could be one of those linchpin early season losses that defines the, the the middle part of the season for the Raiders. This stat from Opta Stats on Twitter or X, um, it's another one of those you know in the weeds stats. But I found it interesting since the two point conversion was adopted in 1994, the Raiders are the only NFL team to attempt a field goal in the last three minutes of the fourth quarter when they were down by exactly eight points. So within a touchdown, two point conversion and ability to tie the game on, on two plays. Um, they're the only team to attempt a field goal in the last three minutes when down by eight points and less than five yards to go. So, I mean, that just, and I don't know how many instances that's happened since 94, but I imagine it's a decent sample size, at least probably a few dozen. And they're the only team to, to go with the field goal in that, in that uh, situation. So th th that alone will tell you how unpopular of a choice that was in your home field. I mean, you had all the momentum. So, uh, yeah, I just thought that was crazy. Brutal. Uh, and as a Steelers fan, very happy that they opted to go for the field goal there. So yeah. um, escape with the win if you're the Steelers. And, and, and that's something you'll take any day, especially against the team that's honestly had their number in recent years. It's the first road win against the Raiders in Mike Tomlin's tenure. Um, so, you know, there's something to be said for, for going to Vegas and, and pulling out a victory. Now the Steelers have the Texans, uh, before they, they go to take on the Ravens after that. So if they can, if they can win next week, find themselves three and one, you are feeling pretty good, uh, despite all of the shortcomings with this offense this year. So, uh, we got two Monday night games coming up here, Mark. We'll quickly do that. It's been a longer episode, but we've, we've had a lot of crazy games this week for sure. Eagles at the Buccaneers and Rams at the Bengals. I have not heard word yet if Joe Burrow is going to play. Yeah, it looks My like game time he's decision. Probably not. I, I'm I'm guessing he's probably not. To be honest with you, but uh, either way, uh, Eagles getting five points at the Bucks, two undefeated teams there, and uh, the Rams uh, are on the road, and Cincinnati is favored by three. So uh, I like the Eagles. It. I like the Eagles to expose the Bucks tonight. I really do. I think Baker on Monday night, that Eagles front seven is going to eat. I think the Eagles will hit big plays early um, against that aging Bucks defense. Buccaneers are feeling themselves a little bit surprising 2-0. I think similar to the Commanders, the way they fell, you know what I mean, to the, to the, to the Bills. I think a good team comes in, takes care of business, prime time. I love the Eagles tonight. And then if the Bengals... I would stay away from this game as far as betting or picking. Yeah, but it's if, a hard one the, to predict. Yeah. If the Bengals don't start Joe Burrow, I would take the Rams. Absolutely. If you can, so if you can get the Rams now and just hope and it, at plus money that Burrow doesn't play, maybe go for it. But otherwise, I'll take the Bengals if Burrow plays. I think Burrow prime time. They've they've looked bad. I think he's going to push to play in this game, and if he does, I think they'll they'll look good enough to win. Yeah, I think the Bengals win even if Burrow doesn't. Uh, play and no, doubting my Rams, that, you know, that's, I, I think it'll be obviously a close game. I wouldn't take them to win the spread. I would say Bengals money line at that point, but I think just the, the tenor of that franchise right now, I mean, if you fall to Owen three, it's just w what a brutal year all around. You're yeah. at home. Like you have an opportunity here uh, even. And with Joe Burrow out, maybe that gives you some sort of lift. I just feel like the Bengals will find a way to eke out a victory uh, against the Rams in this situation on prime time and and Zach Taylor this is your time now to to show up in these moments totally. as well 
Uh, but I agree with you for the Eagles total exposure of the Bucks. I would take that spread all day, hammer that. Um, Eagles just gonna probably dominate that line of scrimmage, and they have good enough guys outside to handle Mike Evans and Chris Godwin. Mm-hmm. So I think the Bucks are gonna have to just dink it and dunk it uh, down to Rashad White a lot and uh, and keep Baker Mayfield clean. And that's just they don't have enough I- offensive firepower, um, you know, underneath to be able to pull that off. The Eagles can just run train on them all day. So I, I think that's what's going to happen there in Tampa. And we got another Monday night doubleheader. So uh, that will do it for our show here on the week three recap. Uh, we may have another show this week, so you just have to stay tuned for that. But if not, of course, we come back every week with our weekly recap episodes every Monday. So stay tuned. Appreciate you all listening and watching. Give us a like, subscribe, hit us up on YouTube or social media. Uh, we, we've got our link tree set up on, on Twitter, Facebook, at FB Lounge Pod. Go check us out there, and uh, we'll see you next time.